I want to turn now to uh, Mark Rosenkurt, the former head of the NTSB, as we look forward to a press conference set to begin with uh, NTSB officials. It's set to begin roughly one, uh, roughly a half an hour from now. And uh, again, the National Transportation Safety Board has taken the lead in the investigation now. So, Mark, what initial questions will they be looking to answer? Absolutely everything remains on the table, so as much information as they possibly can get, both from the actual remains of the, uh, the train itself, uh, a particularly important aspect, of course, is uh, retrieving that uh, uh, black box called a locomotive event recorder, which is going to share a great deal of information with us, how fast the train was actually going when it struck that uh, safety barrier. Also, if in fact the train uh, uh, engineer uh, was uh, attempting to bring the throttle back to slow it down and also to see if he was applying the brake uh, or even the emergency braking system. All of those questions will be answered when we can bring down that uh, uh, event recorder and do the analysis necessary to understand the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, performance factors. Uh, we are looking again at initial uh, pictures and, and video uh, of the scene and it looks frankly, uh, Mark, and I know you've seen these images as well, as though a bomb detonated here. How much uh, will the severity of the damage impact uh, at what pace this, this investigation can move? These are methodical, meticulous examinations. Uh, uh, typically, it takes about a year to get a major investigation completed with a full report, determination of probable cause, and recommend, uh, recommendations presented. Uh, as they go along, if they see any type of major uh, safety gap, the NTSB will report it, and they make an emergency recommendation. Uh, we should learn something in the next couple of weeks uh, about the performance of the train and uh, so any anomalies with the engineer potentially. Well, again, and you mentioned uh, reports uh, suggest the engineer of this train did survive the crash itself. He would have been in that first car, the car that took obviously the, the, the brunt of the impact as uh, the train made contact with the station building I itself. Earlier, our Chris Van Cleve uh, said that in, uh, investigators would look to perhaps even reconstruct the 24 to 48 hours previous to this of that uh, person's life uh, in an effort to really get a sense of what role uh, perhaps operator error could have played in all of this. What will go in then to the investigation of the engineers uh, hours preceding this accident and, and certainly the interview uh, with regard to what they might learn and and I know it look it's a question on many people's minds uh, in the aftermath of events like this uh, what sort of toxicological testing uh, will uh, take place here there will be a toxicological uh, uh, examination. Um, if he survived, they will be uh, looking uh, uh, and trying to do an interview with him as quickly as possible. Uh, if he did uh, uh, pass in the in the investigation in the uh, in the accident itself, they'll do a uh, autopsy to see if in fact there was a medical condition which in fact uh, potentially created the situation uh, that prevented him from stopping the train. Uh, the 72-hour examination will look at his. Uh, basically everything that he was doing. They'll try to find out what he ate. They'll try to find out if he, uh, last time he had any type of alcohol or drug. They will uh, look at his cell phone records to see if uh, he was awake during periods where, in fact, he should have been sleeping. He'll, they'll look at his credit cards. They'll interview um, his family. Uh, all kinds of questions are going to have to be asked to see if this uh, uh, engineer was fit for work. Our Tony DeCopel just reported that while uh, there was uh, perhaps a mechanism in place that could have automatically stopped this train uh, by the time it could have been thrown, it was far too late. We also heard our uh, Chris Van Cleve uh, discussing uh, something known as positive train control. Uh, again, another uh, sort of automatic mechanism by which the train can be remotely uh, stopped. Can you explain, as we've now heard, uh, described various means of automatic control with regard to the train's brakes. What was in place, what wasn't in place, and if not, and if so, why not? 
probably the most important uh, technological assistance we could have is the uh, implementation of a positive train control, which was supposed to be in place by law uh, by the end of last year. But the railroads, because of the cost, uh, were able to uh, uh, lobby the, the Congress to get an extension uh, at least till 2018. They're trying to continue, in some cases, to get it to 2020. New Jersey Transit has promised that they would have it in full place by the end of 2018. It's a very expensive system. For New Jersey Transit, it's going to cost somewhere close to $225 million. But that kind of technology would have prevented this accident from happening. Certainly the cost following this accident has become incalculable. Uh, with regard to security camera footage, then you mentioned, Mark, it, where would these cameras uh, be placed? I, I'm assuming cameras obviously within the station itself on the platform. Where else are the cameras positioned on the train? Uh, some railroads actually have uh, dash cams, uh, similar to what you might see uh, in a police vehicle that you're looking ahead of us down the track. Um, some uh, Amtrak has uh, gotten uh, cab uh, cameras to actually look at the uh, the engineer and see what he is doing, looking at his hands, uh, making sure that he's not distracted, that type of thing. Uh, we don't know if that's a, uh, a device which is in the New Jersey Transit. Certainly the exterior cameras, uh, surveillance and security footage is going to be of great help to the NTSB as they put this, uh, piece this uh, accident together. Following the evacuation process, Mark, we heard that uh, victims not seriously hurt and any number of eyewitnesses were actually making their way to investigators in the initial moments following this disaster to offer their accounts to those investigators. How will then those interviews be curated? We end up uh, having something called survival factors. There's a specialist that will be coming along in this investigative team that is the entire focus of the investigation will be to see how well uh, people were able to survive uh, the accident itself, the kinds of injuries which in fact were sustained, and also attempt to understand the fatalities if uh, there, there were any. I understand at least one has uh, been reported, but that individual was actually on the platform near where the, en the engine struck the uh, safety barriers. Uh, you know, Mark, just as somebody who's seen so many of these, when you look when you look at these pictures and the video images playing out on our screens, what do you think? Uh, there are so many things that in fact uh, could could uh, create this result. Remember, accidents are never one thing. They're a chain of events which ultimately result in a catastrophic ending. And that's what we have to understand before, in fact, we end up jumping to conclusions. A catastrophic ending certainly is something that has transpired today in Hoboken. Mark Rosenker, uh, former NTSB chairman, again, we Always do appreciate your insights, and uh, I know you'll be with us uh, throughout the day here. Again, your time is very much appreciated, Mark. You bet.